Lisa Pettit. And, you know, I just wanted to make the connection between this park and the national park and the fact that we are now part of a broad network of really wonderful public spaces. So this is a trailhead um, to the Towpath Trail. Cuyahoga Valley National Park is 20 miles down the Towpath Trail. You know, Cuyahoga Valley National Park is almost 50 years old. We were established in 19...
and Properties uh, Service Committee to order. Today's uh, Monday, October 3rd, 2022. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you call the roll? Bishop. Here. Moody. Here. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, Director, um, without further ado, we've, uh, we've had um, a lot of calls for um, the, um, the breakdown of our vacant lots and our snow removal readiness and, and everything uh, entailed in that. All right, so we're here. Um, so you want to get started? Yes, sir. Good morning to the, uh, to the chair, to the councilman. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity today to sit with you and give you an update of where we are in the vacant lot and vacant uh, structures program, uh, and also give you an update on our snow and ice control preparedness. Today, today I have at the table uh, new assistant directors are sworn in today, uh, John Laird, uh, Commissioner Anthony Scott over parks and uh, properties, and also Commissioner Randall Scott who oversees uh, the streets division uh, in my group. Uh, so we'll get started uh, with our presentation for you today. Uh, I'll defer to uh, Commissioner Anthony Scott. Good morning to the chair, to the councilman. So just an overview, a lot of it you already know, so I'll try not to bore you with reading line for line. Uh, our 28-week cycle commenced this year, April 18th. As you know, we strive for four cut cycles over the course of those 28 weeks, seven-week cycle. Um, the division averages 45 to 50 crews working daily. Uh, familiar with the tractors, the follow behind the trim crews and that there's a separate hand crew that is utilized on vacant structures. Uh, privately owned lots and structures we also service and in those situations when we're servicing a privately owned structure we do invoice the owner. We use CityWorks as our work management system. We do not service occupied structures. If we get a report or we identify that a structure is occupied, Department of Health inspects that location. It goes through their process of citation, the court, court work order, so forth, so forth and so on. And we're presently in our third cutting cycle, weather permitting. Um, I did not speak with my team this morning, but we should have transitioned into the fourth cycle this morning. Okay, Commissioner, uh, I got a question. Okay. The, um, you say you got 45 to 50 crews working daily. That's correct. Now, how do you break those crews down? I see we have more vacant lots uh, on the east side versus the west side. So how do you break those crews down? Is it done by service center, or how, how does that work? There's a total of five service centers. There's Dobbins okay. North, Dobbins South. There is East 65th. There is Humphrey. And the only service station on the west side is Brookside. Okay. So there's one service station that services all of the wards on the west side. Uh, and the remainder are split among, split up amongst the four on the east side. Okay, all right. Okay. All right, Councilman uh, Casey. Can, uh, Mr. Chairman, to, to the commissioner, can you um, explain what a service, what the service, you said a service center? There's one on the west, one on the west four on the east, right, correct? You call them service centers. Can you, to, um, break it down and tell us the difference between the service center and like, like we have Lorraine Garage, right? So the difference between the Lorraine Garage, you know, where, right? So can you explain the difference between the service, because we also have like Ridge Road, right? So can you explain the difference in the service centers and we call them yards, I don't know what, what they're technically called. To the chair, to the councilman. It just means that that's where the crews are dispatched out of. So Brookside, uh, is the one location on the west side over near Ridge State in that area. And that's what would go to your respective ward, uh, Councilman Slides, Councilman Mooney's. It's distributed amongst there. Dobbins North and South are both located at the same location on uh, Woodland, and they have respective wards that would get service. So, for example, Councilman Bishop would be serviced out of, uh, out of those locations. 
The Humphrey station covers uh, wards 8 and 10. East 65th covers 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 9th. So out of those five locations is where they're distributed to cover the work. Did that address your question? I just, I just, Maybe I'm not understanding. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't understand because I'm just going to use the Lorraine Garage as an example, right? I see tractors coming out of the Lorraine Garage, you know what I'm saying, that go to cut. So Lorraine Garage is not considered a service station, correct? Correct. Uh, okay, even, even though that's where, like, the snow plows are at or whatever. I mean... Is a, is a, okay, so as the assistant director was clarifying, you may be seeing things going out for parks, which is not okay. part of this conversation. Okay. So the five locations are the locations in which we service vacant lots and structures. Okay. All right. That's more clarified. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on that point, I want to ask the question. So th they have a, um, a an operation up in um, Enterprise um, Parkway up there off of Lee Road in Seville. Yes. Uh, that's not a service center, correct? That's uh, to the chair, that's parks. That's parks. That's, we distribute parks uh, teams, service teams out of there, not vacant properties. Vacant properties, okay, so it's a difference. Yes. Sir. Okay, all right, yes, go, go ahead. Although it falls under the same section, they have different uh, territories, different responsibilities, as you know. So okay. I'm strictly speaking, of vacant properties at this presentation. Okay, vacant properties, okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, year to date, and this was as of last week, maybe the 28th, we had serviced a total of 25,779 parcels and completed 86,826 work orders. So to clarify, let's say we're talking about a vacant uh, lot. A vacant lot, average dimension, you may send out one tractor, one trim crew. That's gonna be two service visits. They have to come back to remove any debris. That would be three service visits to that one unique uh, parcel. Conversely, if you have a large one, let's say size of a football field, you may have two tractors converging on it, as well as two to three or four trim crews. So in that scenario, let's say it's two tractors, four trim crews, that's gonna constitute six service visits. So that's why you have it as 25 parcels but even that parcel may take anywhere from two to four service visits in order to properly maintain it per cut. So, so 2022 opportunities observed, changes made and or being made. Um, we're cognizant that this has been a challenging season, so I'm appreciative and I'll say it publicly, I'm appreciative to the director that he's uh, taking some of the considerations that myself, the team have brought to him and allowed us to make some changes. One of which is we've submitted a proposal to use local contractors in a pilot program. Now we're gonna focus that effort on strictly the vacant structures. So structures that actually have, well, properties that actually have structures on them because that's a more manageable number and we're gonna put out the bid to utilize local contractors to be able to service them so that that way we can concentrate, we internally, meaning our uh, full-time, our seasonal and our temporary staff can concentrate on the vacant lots, which are a larger task. Um, we shifted our emphasis to the right-of-ways at the beginning of the cut cycle. So if you're familiar with how we've historically done it is once we made it to a specific subsection and we would start with the right of ways and then work our ways and uh, work our efforts inward. Whereas now when we start the cycle, we prioritize the mains, the right of ways so that that way your commuters see less, uh, less grass growing. And now, Just for a point of clarification, uh, through the chair to the councilman. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that the residents have an understanding that we're actually in the subsections. So what we did was start on the arterial main streets and work our way in to do, to a, do a better job as far as being efficient, first off, in, on the main streets to, to keep foliage from growing so high that it blocks sight lines and things like that on our main roads and then getting into the more residential streets after. 
Okay. All right. All right. Let's stop here for a question. Uh, Councilman Mooney. Just real quick, the pilot program, that's going to be citywide. That is correct. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. So, now, when you saying you do the uh, main, when you say you do the main um, arteries first, you are referring to vacant parcels or are you referring to city property? Both. Both. Okay. All right. I'm going to go to Councilman Sorry, uh, Richard Chair, Stark. Chair, Thank you, Chair. Uh, my only question I will say is, um, is there any um, thing written in that proposal that we can be shared with, with Council to understand um, what the plans are as far as going out to get um, other people to do participate in this pilot program to allow them to help with the assist in grass cutting? Just so I just want to know if we can, as Council can. Th through I'll the chair that. to the councilman. Yes, there, there's a, a proposal. It's still in its infant stage. Uh, we're work, waiting to get through this season, and then we'll be working on that throughout the winter. But the idea is to break the city up into smaller contracts so that we can be uh, attractive to uh, smaller companies, smaller landscape firms. That's, and that's also why we're focusing on the structures and not necessarily the lots, because they're so big. So we already have the larger equipment for uh, the lots, so we're going to focus uh, for smaller companies to focus on the structures. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that we did appreciate um, this year being the second year in this role, had an opportunity to kind of delve into the workstations, talk to the staff, myself and Assistant Commissioner Forge Jr. We went on our around the world, if you would, so that, that way we went out to the various stations. And we found, unfortunately, some inconsistencies as far as how work was assigned, work was inspected, how some of the uh, managers would manage their crews. So one of the things that we did is we went to the director, said we needed uh, an additional position. So we were fortunate to get a position reactivated, and that's essentially the assistant manager. So now we were able to have better distribution of work. Uh, more consistency in training. This is going forward. This is what we're doing now. Um, better oversight, as well as removing some of the administrative tasks from specifically just Ms. Chrisman, now that's shared between her and Mr. John Strauss, who is the assistant manager, as well as shifting a lot of the work to um, Mr. Christian, Mardell Christian, who is a recently hired administrative assistant for Todd Alexander, who, as you know, was the manager for parks and vacant properties. So I say all of that uh, in aggregate would allow us to have better supervision over our crews, more time actually in the field to ensure that we're having a better performance, better productivity. One of the other things you notice is that we're working with the administration on ABLs automatic vehicle locator so that that way we can keep better track of where the teams are, remove any potential lollygagging that's going on, as well as be able to look at route optimization, see if what we've been doing is antiquated and we need to shift based off of, obviously, as you all know, the growth in uh, vacant structures and lots that have occurred over the last decade or so. Um, another thing, the vacant lot tree issues. I know everyone's like, well, why are you bringing up trees? Because the vacant property team was involved in that as well. They would be out servicing complaints that there was at least a rudimentary level of service that they could perform, then they were doing it. We've taken all of that from out of vacant property. We've put it where it rightfully belongs, urban forestry. Um, so now that doesn't take away from the, the unit leaders, the managers out there they can still stay with their crews, which is the priority. Um, we performed 74 days of overtime this season, 37 days due to inclement weather. We didn't do overtime. We really couldn't even get in the field based off of the weather operations. Um, I'll stop there and entertain more questions again. I don't want to insult you by reading you line for line. Okay. Um, Commissioner? The staffing levels, um, can you can you be a little bit more specific on the staffing levels? How many workers 
Um, are we, uh, do we have currently working in uh, vacant properties in, uh, versus this year versus last year? How many supervisors do we have actually supervising those crews? So we had a deficiency in supervisors this year. What we had last year were 10 supervisors, five unit leaders, and then we activated what's known as a dual, which is someone who is a RMW, real estate maintenance worker, who based off of their skill and expertise serves in a temporary position as a supervisor. We only had two duels this season. We sought to identify people through attrition. We would identify someone, we would lose them. Uh, and unfortunately became a trickle effect even in our park operations because we couldn't pull people that had expertise from parks into vacant properties because we had deficiencies there due to either retirements, demotions, um, well, those are the two reasons. So some of the more seasoned unit leaders were able to maintain without a duel, um, but a lot of them really had to lean on their maintenance workers who might not have, honestly, might not have wanted to permanently be in that dual position because they can appreciate the pressure. They just wanted to be able to work and occasionally fill in, but they just, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't fill that gap. <coughs> We're still striving to, but we haven't been able to yet. Okay, you uh, you also mentioned the vehicle locators, the system we use for vehicle locators. Um, no, no, none of our crews to currently in vacant properties are have vehicle locators on them. No, in my in my division, the only vehicles that have AVLs are actually in urban forestry, which is some of the newer vehicles. And if there are, it's some that might have been a vehicle that was on loan for someone, but it's not a system that we were utilizing, so we couldn't track it either way. But that's been turned into uh, the administration, and they're moving forward aggressively with that. So we're optimistic to see them next season. Okay. Prior so, to next season. so you want to get vehicle locators on the tractors, or is it the pickup trucks, or the fleet, the, the whole, the entire, entire fleet. fleet? It's got four wheels, and it can move on its own. And that's where I want if to it goes out, if it yeah. goes out in the field, they need to, you need to know where it is. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner, in regards to um, hiring private contractors, um, we know that the county land bank also uses private contractors to take care of their lots. Why not partner with them, just like we do with demolitions, um, to try to work something out with the county land bank? for some of these vacant properties and structures. And then I have one other question. Well, chair to the council, uh, that's not off the table. Before okay. I drafted the proposal, I was having a conversation with Mr. Frango, Mr. Roberts, and they were very forthcoming with information and they did even uh, say that they would be a minimal to the conversation. Okay. So it's not off the table, sir. All right, I was, I was just wondering because the, we partner with them at some other things with this yes, demolitions and stuff like that. And then if we can go back to unique parcels serviced, um, that's not how many, is, it, is that how many vacant lots and or uh, vacant properties there are that you that's guys have serviced? That's how many that we've serviced, whether it's city owned and or owned by okay. a private citizen. Are those, so I'm just gonna use my ward as an example, 243, right? Does, are you, are you, According to this, are you saying that there's 243 either vacant properties or lots in Ward 16? No, that we service, okay. So out of whatever your number is, right. we have touched 243 times X amount of times. Okay. Is there, a, is there any way to get that broken down per ward by how many vacant lots there are? And then how many vacant properties that you guys actually service? Because vacant properties could be, they could be vacant one week and not the next, right? So how many you service and then how many actual vacant lots we, we have per ward? Because this doesn't tell us that, correct? What, this is just telling you what we service. Right, um, exactly. To the chair, to the councilman. I, I know that I can get those numbers broken down by what's lots and what are properties? Okay, I have to do some. All right, that that would that would be that would be that that, that that would be we, sufficient yeah. enough. 
I just, in, in, in my ward, I just think that that's high, right? I mean, just, I know we don't have many vacant lots in, in Ward 16, and I'm just surprised at that, uh, at that number. So if, if we could get that broken down, yes, that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, so now going back to this, um, Commissioner, going back to this chart right here, this is just the vacant structures, correct? This is not vacant lots. That's both, sir. Okay. That's All right. Combined. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Is there any more questions from Chairman? Councilman Joe Jones. Uh, looking at this, um, so like for an example, uh, and I know um, some of this has probably already been maybe been answered. Um, the one is that when we look at wards one through 17, the completed task, is that the total number of cuts throughout the annual year? That's at the end of this? To the, to the chair, to the councilman, the 86,826 is the amount of service visits. I understand, for ward one, where it says 4,578, is that, what is that, cuts, or is that, what was that figure telling me? That's everything, sir. So in that number, uh, to the chair, to the councilman. So that's the amount of total service visits. So that's tallying up the total of tractor visits, uh, trim crews that followed behind, as well as uh, vacant structures, as well as if there was any loader tasks as well. I see. So more crew vacant structures, is that 527? So we have 527 vacant structures in Ward 1? Uh, that is not what that's saying, sir. That 527, uh, to the chair, to the uh, councilman, that means that there were 527 service visits by mower crews on vacant structures. Okay, so how many vacant structures do we have? The, the well, you should uh, know, because he's got these numbers. To the chair, to the council, that's the question that uh, Councilman Casey asked us to provide the split between what's vacant lots and what's right. vacant structures, so I'll have to provide that to you at a right. subsequent time. So, so we know how many services, but we don't know how many vacant structures versus vacant lots. To the chair, to the council. No, that 1,112 is the total. I have to provide you subsequently with a breakdown. Of so the then are we sure the number that we have, the top, was, top that says total of 25,779 parcels? Are we sure we have that? Because if we're not sure that of this number here, then how do we be sure that this is the number here? Because that's the Right, but how we know how many parcels is this? I mean, you would have to know that. I mean, the, 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 Mr. Chairman, here's the issue at hand here, and, and it's, it's real simple. Um, if we're doing these cuts, our system should be able to tell us how many vacant structures that we have in each of our wards in order to tally these numbers. It should also be able to tell us how many vacant lots we have in each of our wards. Um, so it, I don't. Unless we're, I don't, I don't understand why there's such a gray zone here. To the chair, okay. the, the numbers, we do have the numbers. I just don't have the breakdown in front of you, sir. Oh, so I'll get it to you subsequently as to how those numbers are split between lots and structures. And, and you also have the locations of where all of those are at too, correct? That is correct. Okay. To the chair, to so the can, can you give, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, a request of information? Can you please give me all of the vacant um, structures that we have cut uh, in my neighborhood? Uh, in addition to um, all of the vacant lot location parcels uh, in the neighborhood, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner, is there like a map that you work off of, a zoning, a system that tells you where these locations are? To the chair, to the council, what, what occurs is inspectors go out, they identify locations that are vacant, that are in need of service, and they input those in the city works to say that this is a service request that needs to be performed. So if I understand the question, you're asking do I have a, a total of any and all vacant lots and structures in your ward or any of your wards, I do not have that. What I can gather 
is the locations of any lots or structures that we've serviced okay. in your respective wards. That's fine. If, if we could get a list of that, of the ones that you've already serviced uh, in the neighborhoods, that, that's, that's very helpful. Um, and do you also perform services on commercial properties? We should, if it's a vacant structure, then we would perform uh, the same service if it's vacant. What? Occupied, no. So if, since here to the council, if I may, so if there was a location on Miles that was vacant and they hadn't been performing their services, then we would service it and still cite the owner for those services. And, and then, Mr. Chairman, if once, you, if once you've gotten that information over, that would be very helpful. Can you give it over to us digital, where we can be able to have a look at it on the, on the spreadsheet? Do you have it based on the spreadsheet? It would be to the chair, too. It would be in an Excel uh, spreadsheet. And, and does it, it have the parcel number and the address, too? To the chair, to I have to follow up. I don't know that right. answer off the top of my head, sir. Yeah, all that information would be good because we want to be able to get that information to our local development corporation so that we can start looking at what's what in terms of what's available, what's vacant, what needs to be dealt with. And then if, if that could be made available soon, because we're getting together all of our issues for next year, um, we, you know, we want to try to get ahead of this and try to work with your department so that we won't have the same kind of scenario, unfortunately, that we've had under the former administration. Yes, sir. Um, so being able to get these lots cut um, and not have an, um, uh, the east side look abandoned in certain areas and depressing, um, it will be very helpful to, to begin to, to, to see where we can start targeting in and taking care of some of those issues. And then do we have a, who, well, I think we had that conversation, so um, I'll leave that one alone. Through, through the Mr. Council, Chairman. Through the Chairman. Okay, Council. Uh, I did want to just make mention of, to your point, we have uh, been starting to utilize our work order management system uh, even more so throughout the season, but we do have a ways to go as it relates to asset management, and that's kind of what we're talking about now is like the actual unique parcels and things like that. So we're getting better at that, you know, throughout this season. That's kind of what I was mentioning, some of the improvements that we will be making over the winter as the season ends. And, and Mr. Chairman, just so that, so all of these for in an annual year on vacant properties as well as vacant lots, we're only able to get to them three to four times. To the councilman, yes, four service visits uh, over a 28-week period. Yeah, that that won't work, Mr. Chairman. I mean, th this is this is horrible to uh, be able to cut a vacant lot or a vacant structure only four times out of a year. I mean, I cut my grass once a week, so you're telling me that you won't be able to cut this grass, but three times, if lucky, get maybe a fourth hit. That's just that's not, Mr. Chairman. If we continue with a program like this. Um, uh, we're going to continue to see people run out of our neighborhoods. Um, no one wants to live next to a vacant lot or a abandoned structure with five foot, six foot tall grass. I, I don't know anybody in their right mind who wants to live in a neighborhood. And if you have two or three, four or five of them on your street, you're in a mess. You're, you're really, you know, it, it really looks bad. And, and Mr. Chairman, you know, to, to further you know, deliver the, 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 the message here. It's, it's sad that a councilman has to go and get a lawnmower and cut the grass. It, it, it really is sad for a, an elected official who's calling in to the administration, and this is what I've had to deal with when I called in to Cox uh, about getting grass cut. Uh, well, it is what it is. We only can go but so fast. We'll get to your ward when we get there. And I've had to get on my riding lawnmower with my trailer, just so happened I run an operation where I can do this, and go out and cut vacant lots in my neighborhood, just to make sure that my citizens are happy, that something is getting done. And it's unacceptable for a city that has a 1.8 billion, with a B budget, uh, to not be able to go out there and get those grass cut in a more efficient, effective manner. So are we saying, Mr. Chairman, that we're going to accept three to four cuts again? We're going to sit here and, and take three to four more cuts again? Is that what we're talking about, Mr. Chairman? 
Well, Councilman, you, you know we we first have to let the, let the administration work the kinks out. Uh, this is a new this is a new team, so to speak. Uh, I agree um, that three cuts is not enough for our citizens. Um, uh, Director, you say the program starts, the, you, your cutting season starts at what, what, uh, what, what date? Mr. Chair, it was April 18th this year. Okay, so, uh, you know, and, uh, I, and I guess everybody knows at the table that in the spring, the grass grows a lot faster than it does in August and in uh, September. Uh, is there a possibility that we can get started a, a little, uh, little earlier in the season? Uh, because I know springtime, I get beat up uh, in my neighborhood because of high grass. So have you thought about that, uh, Director and Commissioner? Through the Chair, uh, yes, we have, and we will be taking that into consideration as well. Uh, and to the Chair, to the Councilman, we're also looking at uh, all types of methods to uh, help with this issue. Uh, one of the things we're piloting is clover leaf, using clover leaf for the, the uh, 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 abandoned properties, uh, and hopefully long term utilizing that. Uh, if it does work, we're piloting right now and just seeing how things go. But we're looking at uh, all types of approaches to uh, approach this issue going forward, especially with the uh, putting out for uh, the help for private contractors as well. Okay. All and, right, and, Councilman and, Jones, are but, you uh, No, Mr. Chairman, because see, listen, you know, I, I sat here uh, all this year. And, and, and I hear about the rainy season, all that, right? And I've heard all the excuses coming out of Cox because I was on his phone and, he, and I was calling him as much as I could reach him. Sometimes I had to come down here and chase him down. Um, the issue is this, is that for seven months out of this year to July, we've had tall grass, four or five feet. And so if this was happening, Mr. Chairman, on the west side, I am guarantee you my colleagues wouldn't stand for it. And they will be in, up in arms about this and somebody lost their job. To sit here and tell me that we have three to four grass cuts, maybe, that's unacceptable. They need to be cutting these lots twice a month. If you go to any other municipality, that cares anything about public service. They cut those lots, they give those, they have their teams out there, they cut those lots, they charge those people the money that they need to cut those lots and they have those contractors out there cutting those lots left and right. They're doing it in Warrensville, they're doing it in Maple Heights, they're doing it in Garfield, they're doing it in Shaker Heights, all around me. And my citizens should be given the same kind of public service that we give on the west side. You know, there's this thing sitting here at this table where they say, oh, well, if you offer a service on this side of town, the service needs to be equal on the other side of town. But that's not the case right here, Mr. Chairman. In our side of the town, east side, we've got these tall grasses all over the place, and I'm trying to retain citizens in my neighborhood, and I can't retain them in my neighborhood when they see abandonment all around them. And then they're told that maybe in two to three months you might see a cut there. Come on, are you kidding me? So this is unacceptable. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that you ask the administration to come back to the table and reinvent themselves. That means that these three to four grass cuts need to be a grass cut at least once a month, at least on the bad end. Now, what they should be doing is cutting it twice a month. Not, not three to four times out of a year. Maybe you're lucky if you get a fourth cut. So, Mr. Chairman, this is unacceptable. And if we don't draw the line right here at this table, and I've sat here at this table and I've talked to the last director and I've asked him each time, how much money do you need? What will it take to get the job done? So either we have people who can't get the job done, don't want to get the job done, or all of the above. They're not getting the job done. So if it takes us giving them more money, I'm, I'm for that. But we cannot continue to lose the east side of the city of Cleveland to having vacant structures, vacant lots that's got five foot, six foot grass that's really tall, and then it takes them three months to come back and cut that grass. Come on. 
Now, if we sit here and we pass off for $1.8 billion, and then we're all on the east side as elected officials, we're going to get booted out of office if we can't get a vacant lot cut and a vacant structure cut. It's about public service. And if we can't do that here in our, in our neighborhood, we ain't building no new houses. We're not getting brand new commercial strips coming down. We don't have concrete infrastructure roads rolling all throughout our neighborhoods. So at the end of the day, we should at least be able to get a grass cut. Can we at least get a grass cut, Mr. Chairman, to the director? Can we at least have a better program put in place that's going to address this issue? Okay, director. To the chair, to the councilman, uh, I do hear your concerns, and we are, I've gotten here in May, and we have made some uh, changes that may not necessarily uh, be reflective yet this year, but again, I do think that it's a multifaceted approach that we will have to take, uh, whether it be supply chain, whether it be staffing, whether it be process, whether it be uh, utilizing other contractors, help from other partners. I think that the, the problem, because the actual inventory is growing and so we we have to adapt and, and that's my charge to do that and lead that effort and, and mr. chairman to the director I will work with you I, I will sit down I've made a numerous suggestions how we should streamline this process in years past I even talked to uh, mrs. Mowers uh, who replaced Anthony Bracatelli at the time about what needed to be done to change the department and how we needed to move these processes down the road so I don't mind mr. chairman working with you uh, director I've been all down in those houses I've, 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 I've taken an assessment of your staff I've taken an assessment of how much equipment you have I've taken an assessment of the of the of the people who work for you I've even seen the the recruiting system how it works I even see how you even train your folks so at the end of the day I've had to do that only because I'm totally upset and this is totally unacceptable to offer an inferior service to the citizens of the southeast and the east side of the city of Cleveland who unfortunately have the, the enormity of these vacant lots and these vacant structures and not getting them cut. And, and, and here what makes it even worse, Mr. Chairman, we don't even have a crew at least in the years past, when people are having their 80th anniversary for themselves or their families, and I call out, or having a wedding, or having some kind of birthday party, I call out, say, can you please cut those vacant structures? Can you please cut those vacant lots? And, and still unable to get them all done. Now, on every now and then, I may get that request taken care of. But in times past, I've had to go out there, jump in my trailer, get my weed whacker, get my lawnmower, my ride lawnmower, and my next guy to go and cut those lots to clean them off so that these little old ladies who are 90-some years old celebrating their birthdays, God bless their souls, and cutting their grass and getting it done. But we got to do a better job than what we have and what we've been doing. And I know, Mr. Chairman, that the challenges are there because I saw your operation. You have, Mr. Chairman, to the director, a lot of work to do. You have a lot of infrastructure work to do, and you have a lot of work to do on making sure that you have the proper staffing, and I'm not sure if you can get them in now. But what I will say, Mr. Chairman, okay. what I will say, Mr. Chairman, is that there needs to be an increase in what we pay those workers who go out there and cut that grass. Right now, all of the entire structure needs to be fundamentally looked at because you will not get people coming in and, and have quality people coming in and we're paying them at what we're paying them uh, through this staffing process. So there's a number of things that needs to be looked at. And Mr. Chairman, also subcontracting also needs to be looked at. So we need to look at ways and means. We, we, uh, we, 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 we have talked about subcontracting. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, would you uh, allow Richard Starr to have a point, Councilman Mr. Starr? Chairman, I yield the floor. I, I look to work with okay. the new administration right. to get this done. All right, on that point, Councilman Starr. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, my colleague, Councilman um, Joe Jones, for bringing up um, some, some thoughts and, and expressing his feelings regarding grass cut, cutting. Um, I, too, have a just one point that I want to ask the table, Chair, um, to the table will be, I know that when I first got in office earlier this year, we had to allocate some funding to di get different crews in each of our wards, correct, Chair, to, to Commissioner? Chair, to the Councilman, it was optional if uh, 
if you wanted to fund a ward crew. Yes, sir. All right. Now, my, my question would be then is, if we don't fund a ward crew, what happens to that ward as far as the, the grass and the parcel that needs to be cut? To the chair, to the councilman, you continue to still get your service. The purpose of a ward crew was that there was a crew that stays in your ward even once the systematic cut has moved on to the next location so that that way you have the ability to command the team to service things immediately as opposed to waiting for us to return for the next cycle. Okay, on that point, uh, Councilman, yeah. uh, can you explain the, um, the what the service crews do in the wards? Do they do vacant lots or vacant properties? Okay, go ahead. Uh, to the chair, to the council, it's a vacant structure crew. And the reason being is they're not out there with a industrial tractor and a trim crew that follows behind them. They specifically are servicing the structures in your in your world. Okay, um, my, my point that I would bring up from that is if we pay for a crew to do the vacant structure um, parcels in our, in our ward, um, I think that should be something that added to the budget as opposed to us having to allocate funds for that. And here's why, because I think those vacant structure crews should have full service of equipment because there's things in our ward that needs to cut. Uh, prime example, I'm dealing with a situation on East 61st and Central where there's, there's vacant land in between um, 61st and 59th, but right there in that vacant lot you can't see because some of the tree branches and everything is have grown to the highest capacity that it can be, but then sometimes it comes into an issue that it can't be cut by that vacant crew. Um, so therefore, we've been trying to figure out, um, I know me and Commissioner and Tamisha has been going back and forth, figuring out what's the best solution, but those type of things are very important because I have seniors right there on, 60, on 61st and Central, uh, 59th and Central, and they, are, they want that lot cut in which the grass get cut, but then that, that wall of tree branches that shows that you can't see from each side of the street, you know, it's something hard that they can't do with the vacant structure crew. So I wanted to ask um, if there's a budget that can be created to show what it will cost to have the vacant structure crew um, operating at full capacity, similar to other folks in municipal service and parks and maintenance that does cutting to be able to figure out how much money needs to be added one, and then two, from what we allocate funds as council, how much that costs to be added into the budget as well, instead of council members having to put money to do some stuff that is public service that should be done already through the administration. So from the chair to the table, can we create something like that, those budgets, so we can see what it is, so we can try to get that added into our budget, probably to the upcoming year? Through the chair to the councilman, yes. Uh, all, all things are on the table to increase the level of service, service delivery going forward. And to your point about the other brushes and uh, shrubbery that needs to be taken care of, we're taking a look at how we better approach that from the urban forestry perspective as well. And then um, one more point, um, Chair, I would, I would make, um, but I think it's probably going to be when we get into snow. Um, so. Okay. I am. All right. All right. Thank you, Councilman Starr. Uh, Councilman Brian Mooney. Uh, thanks. Through, through the chair, just looking at your sheet, uh, maybe this is for Director Scott, I'm not sure. When, when you talk about loaders here, there's loaders, does that mean dumping on, on these lots? Is that what, what you refer to as loader visits? To, to the, the chair, to the Councilman, yes, sir. Okay, so that's, that's dumping. Like yes, somebody sir. dumps couches, tires, whatever, and that's a loader to to clear off the debris from, that's what that's about. To the chair, to the councilman, yes it is. Now, I want to clarify though, this is not the totality of the illegal dumping. Mm -hmm. These are service visits in conjunction with the grass cutting. So, for example, a team comes out and they are servicing a lot. The tractor comes, then the trim crew comes. They will take any debris, large debris that they found. Commissioner, the Commissioner, can you... Uh Pull the mic up to you. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry, to the chair, to Gossman. So the tractor crew, the tractor crew would, uh, or the tractor would cut it again. The trim crew would come behind it, and as they're servicing it, they would pull any large debris that they found to the 
front of the uh, of the parcel so that that way they could then request that a loader comes behind them to remove it. So this is not to be confused with what's being done with the illegal dumping initiative. Oh, so you're talking about branches or something. If somebody dumps branches, because they're not dragging couches to the curb. Toilets, couches. Oh, they do have couches too? So this is we, anything. We find anything out there, sir. Oh, wow. I right, think that was my question. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman Mooney. Uh, we're going to go to Councilwoman Rebecca Murray. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, it's funny because on my way in, I saw a crew um, doing the median over at Fleet and East 49th. And I was like, wait a second, are they going to be back in the ward right now? And then I saw here that you're beginning the fourth cutting cycle with the right of ways, uh, hopefully starting this morning. So I can confirm that your crews are out doing the right of ways um, in Ward 12. So thank you very much. Um, I know that... Um, I was wondering if I could understand a little bit more, I might have missed it uh, right in the beginning, but the um, local contractors to perform nuisance abatement services on vacant structures only. Um, so obviously I think we've heard that, um, you know, there's definitely interest on both sides of the table of trying to contract out some of the work so that we can lighten the load a little bit. Um, is this discussing contracting out the mowing on vacant structures, or is this talking about contracting out sort of broader cleanups on, on vacant structures through the chair? Through the chair to the councilwoman. It's specifically a pilot program to identify uh, contractors, small contractors, MBEs, SBEs, VBEs, that would bid on cutting the vacant structures. That's a smaller universe, again, it's, um, continue to enforce the word pilot so that that way we can concentrate the efforts on the structures and our teams, our full-time, part-times, and seasonals can concentrate on reducing the amount of time, the disparity between servicing of vacant lots. Gotcha. Okay, that helps. So this is specifically for the um, vacant structures, yeah. um, not... Um, well, for mowing at vacant structures and, and possibly other types of cleanup at vacant structures. To the chair, to the council. Yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so then, uh, you know, one thing that we have seen. Well, I, so here's here's one question I have. As I was looking at this crew this morning at at, at Fleet, um, that poor intersection at Fleet and East 49th, um, <laughs> Mr. Scott, or, uh, uh, Randy, I have sent over so many times these like different concrete and brick areas, and wouldn't you know, another area at that same intersection needs to get done, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be nice if the crew that was out doing the landscaping all, they can clearly see that the, there's like a concrete curb that's now falling down into the road again. Do, do the crews that are out doing um, this work ever turn in other, um, put in other work orders? Do they have the capability to put in other work orders while they're out in the field through the chair to the director? To, through the chair to the director, yes. Or to the council, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll take the promotion, though. <laughs> uh, but yes, they do. And we are enhancing that. Uh, that was kind of what I was mentioning when we were talking about the work order management system. We are working on unifying the uh, work order management system throughout the entire department so that we can even get better at that task. Got it. Okay, that would that would be great because I, I feel like that's so much of this job sometimes is that you're driving around and I'm like, has anyone turned that in? I, I will turn it in and, and you know, it would be, I, I would love to know how many times I turn in something that another crew has already caught or, you know, even try to get that understanding so we get more more overlap and catch more of those things early because I know from the um, prior times that this intersection has had issues that it can take a little while to get the right crew out there. Um, so... My next question is about the um, uh, is about cleanups um, and sort of the uh, work between different departments between health and public works. I have a lot of vacant properties where people are dumping things, um, and uh, Ms. Crisman has been incredibly helpful this season in terms of managing the workflow. Where I send something into her. And then I don't actually have much insight as to what happens next. Could you tell me a little bit about when I say, oh, there's a house that has, um, you know, a vacant house with a couch dumped in the back. Um, how does that get from me to getting completed through the, through the chair? The chair to the councilwoman. So at present, there is not a dedicated illegal dumping team. It's maintained within the public works umbrella, and it's actually my division 
and Commissioner Randy Scott that share that responsibility. So because of the amount of work that we're engaged in with grass cutting, we relinquish it to their team from April to November. And then it comes back to us from November to April. So when we receive them, it may appear as if we're dealing with them. We're not, we're actually forwarding it to Mr. Campbell who is one of Commissioner Randy Scott's employees. And he's very good. He is, he <laughs> is. I've had occasion to talk with him and work on some larger issues. So yeah, Randy, I'm gonna steal him if I can. Um, <laughs> but to that end, so if it's a smaller task, so as, as you saw with Councilman Mooney's question about the loaders, if it's a smaller task, I usually tend, particularly if I have seen the location or you, your office, and many of your offices will send in photos, if we can assess that it's a smaller issue, then we'll address it so as not to bother Mr. Campbell and his team. A larger issue will route to Mr. Campbell. Gotcha. So does that mean we're losing Mr. Campbell in November? It goes to somebody else next month? It'll come back to us. <sighs> okay. Through the chair to the councilman because he we need him for snow and ice control. He helps with that. <laughs> oh, fine, fine, fine. I guess that's important as well. Um, Okay, so uh, last last question is just this point about the um, project clean crews and the tractors. Um, you know, I I wonder is is there any as you kind of think about the next iteration of that program? And I definitely agree with Councilman Starr that I hope we can find a way to provide this sort of additional service for the wards without it having to be paid through you know individual ward funds. Um, one of the limitations, of course, has been tractors, right? Um, so that's something you mentioned. I, I have a, um, I have a lot. I have, I have five, I have five consecutive vacant lots that I would love to just uh, get a second mow on before get a, get another mow on before the end of the year. But I probably can't because there's not a tractor for the project clean crew um, through the chair to the director. Is that is that my understanding? Is that correct? That for those larger lots. The project clean crew can't engage with those? To the chair, to the councilman. Just as a practical matter, they can't. Now, the reality is if you have a crew and you want to use them all day on one lot, <laughs> but as a practical matter, no. There's not a tractor, there's not an inventory of tractors that are presently set aside that just stay with the crews. Yeah. They have their hand mowers, their trimmers, backpack blowers, and that's the extent of it as present. But to quote the director, anything's on the table at this point. Okay, I appreciate that. And, and I, I wonder if one of those might be um, additional funding for more tractors so that you guys also have more, of a, more wiggle room in case some are down. My understanding is that they kind of go down periodically and need maintenance, and sometimes that can slow down the cutting cycle. So um, are you expecting any type of um, requisition request for additional tractors on the upcoming budget cycle through the chair? Through the chair. To the council, and yes, uh, keep it in mind that we are experiencing supply chain issues that are impacting all of uh, the departmental equipment needs. Uh, but we are uh, expecting to increase numbers as as necessary. Okay, um, and I'm sorry, I keep thinking of more questions as I as I go. So I, I thought that was my last one, but then I have I have one more. Um, the uh, the contracting out for vacant structures. Are there any union issues with that? I know that you know unions are the, the union folks are supposed to be the ones cutting the vacant lots. Is there any issues with um, outsourcing the structures themselves? Through the chair to the councilwoman, there could possibly be. We haven't gotten that far yet, but we are taking that into consideration as we're preparing uh, the pilot. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Councilman Mario. Uh, Councilman Brian Case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner, if we could just move real quick to um, billing and collections, right? When when we cut these these lots, now we know in the past that the county would only let us access the tax duplicate once a year, right? And then what that does is that opens up the flippers and the LLCs prior to getting their assessments to flip the properties and then we're, we're out of luck again because now the property is no longer in the name and we can't find anybody. So how successful have we been, we'll just say in the last year, at actually assessing um, the uh, build to the to the property owner and then also to piggyback on that i'm not saying for for homeowners right um, i'm talking for property investment owners more specifically the out-of-state ones have we ever considered or are we considering 
um, liens on those properties um, prior to the sale of anything. Through, through the chairs of the councilman, uh, keep it in mind that the Department of Public Works, we're more of the doers. That's right. pretty much outside of our group, but I can get you that information though. Okay, so it's not the Department of Public Works that actually bills, you guys send it through? To the chair, to the councilman, we send it uh, twice a year actually. It's twice a year, it goes to the Division of Assessments and Licenses okay. for the City of Cleveland and thereafter, it's in their hands to process. Okay. The only part that we're engaged in, as the director said, obviously is the doers. And if it's engaged in any kind of protest process before it goes there, okay. that's within my office. All right, so we could get that from assessments and licenses then. Yeah. Okay. Right. To, to, the, to, the, uh, from, to the chair, to the, the councilman, we, we do lean. Okay. But we do have to get a clean lean, to your point. And it is a, a matter of time. So you have this short window of time where we are actually sending assessments and license sends information over to the county. And we actually, if they still do it, they have a log where they keep this information and people, if they're gonna buy a property, they, they know that a lien is coming. Okay. So they do lien the property and most of the collections that we get from the county comes from those liens. Okay, all right. And then thank you very much for that information. Um, if we could just pivot real quick. You have, you said before you have 45 to 50 crews that, that are out working. Um, how many, people are in those crews? How many, how many people do we actually have out there on the streets doing the work? Right. To the chair, to the councilman, the crews are traditionally two at most three people. Okay. So tractors, obviously, uh, one. one man, one right. woman team. The trim crews, two to three employees. The vacant structure crews are almost always two employees. And those consist of uh, almost exclusively the temporary employees that we use. Okay, and then if we could just touch on real quick the, um, the disbursement of those crews, right? Because um, we know that, for example, the southeast side of the city of Cleveland received over 13,200 completed tasks this year, right? Where the far west side of Cleveland received less than 1,000, mm -hmm. right? So how do we go about dispersing those crews when there's certain sections of the city of Cleveland that needs a lot more tasks to be completed than others, so, which, which is showing more, I know there's more work to be done, but that's also showing more attention to those portions of the city of Cleveland. I wish nobody, I wish we didn't even have to have this, right? I mean, that would be the ultimate goal. But how do you go about dispersing these 45 to 50 crews, right? And you're saying that it comes through every seven weeks. Um, how, does, how do you guys manage that portion of, of your crews? If we're optimally staffed, then you'll see, let's, we'll use 50. Then you have 10 crews that may go out from each of the five respective sections. What we find ourselves having to do is the work that is being done in one area may be more than what they have. So we do have to periodically pivot and move teams to other sides. It's happened with uh, Mr. Strauss and we've used his teams on the east side in order to make sure that they can keep up because the workload is higher. But in a perfect, perfect situation, then they're optimized across the, they're, uh, they're balanced across the five stations. All right, so you, for example, you could take the, Brooks, the Brookside people, the crews out of there, and they could go to the southeast side of Cleveland and be working way over there, even though there's four other stations on the east side, correct? The, Potentially uh, that could happen. To the chair, to the council, there's one week I recall that we actually used the Brookside crew, we actually permanently situated them on the east side for that week so that that way there weren't issues of trying to deal with traffic back and forth. They just went and reported there and we may have maintained one or two crews at Brookside to deal with happenstance that may come up and then also uh, right of way in order to hit that. But then it's, it's one of the things we've had to be more uh, intentional about this year, seeing where we need to move people because of deficiencies, staffing equipment, so forth. But it, it does happen from time to time, yes, sir. All right, and then my last question, Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner. Um, is staffing an issue? I mean, all, I mean, you're saying we have probably anywhere between maybe 100 and 150 people out there taking care of all these vacant lots and structures, right? 
do we have enough people? Are we trying to get enough people earlier? We know the city has a problem hiring anybody, right? It could take months and months to hire somebody, even if they're temporary. Are we starting early enough so that when that April date hits, we're ready to go on the ground to take so, off? So to the chair, to the councilman, uh, I appreciate that question. And no, we never have enough staff, never. For optimal performance, and by optimal, I just mean with what we have in front of you, we would need 150 temporary employees. There was a point within the last three weeks that we only had 100. I mean, it's a constant process of attrition. We deal with a lot of discipline issues. We've had, I believe, year to date, eight training classes for a due to attrition. Now, the first three are given. That's getting large volumes of crews onboarded, getting them out. But then we've had to have five more. And again, that's year to date. The season isn't over. Last year we had nine, uh, which was still clearly horrible, but across the whole season. So it is a challenge. It is a challenge. We start, I want to give clarification to a point. We started cutting April 18th. Well, actually, it snowed on April 18th and 19th, so we didn't. But we're out there a month in advance getting people onboarded. We're out there doing uh, what I call policing the lots, doing walkthroughs to get large items that may have been dumped there so that that way it doesn't tear up the tractor as soon as we hit the ground running. So whereas we do say the first official day is April 18th, there's a preseason. There's a preseason. Just like the Browns, some people may say the preseason doesn't count, but for us it does. Mm -hmm. But when it officially started was the 18th, but we were out there early March interviewing, training, uh, PM and the, uh, the equipment. We were doing all of that. All right, thank you. And then, Mr. Chairman, if we could hear from uh, the new, you were just sworn in, <laughs> the new assistant director, Laird. Um, can you just give us a little information on yourself, who sure. you are, how long you've been with us? Absolutely. Because the longer you're going to be with us, if you look down to your right, <laughs> you, see what, you see what you got to look forward to. Uh, um, so keep it while you can. Good people here. They're great people here. Actually, I've, I've been with the city 22 years. Okay. Um, I've, I've actually been, I was with the Department of Public Works when it was first combined. Before that, I was in the, uh, the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Properties. Uh, I was the manager of administration for this department for about 10 years. Um, before that, my previous life, I was the deputy commissioner of park maintenance. So everything that the commissioner here is going through, I'm kind of been like a, a shadow mentor, if you will, uh, to, the, to him on that. Um, but that's, so to the director's point about multifaceted approach to the properties, it, it definitely is. There is one thing, I, I, and I know you as council understand this, but one of the things please, that... Please, you can talk into the mic. Okay. Sure, I'm sorry. One thing I know you understand that as, as council that w one of the biggest issues that we have with vacant properties is that these properties belong to other people. And we have become, over time, this was a very small program 20 years ago where we were only dealing with vacant lots. And then over time, we realized, this council also realized that, hey, there's a bigger issue out there we started taking on structures and we started taking on and then you know the whole recession hit and that landscape of what we had 2,000 properties turned into as you saw see 25,000 and so there there really are other issues that have to be yes we have to cut the grass yes we have to do better yes we have to get better deployment but there are other things about what do we do with this land once we once we you know are we going to just keep being the landscaper are we going to think about other people taking it over we have to talk about are there do we need to, how do we penalize people whose land this is and they just walk away from it? What are those, these are the multifaceted pieces that the director is saying that we really have to delve into if we really want to see a holistic solution. But I totally agree with this body, we've got to do better and we are going to do better. But I do think that there are so many pieces, uh, partnerships, all these things have to work together for this to work and, and that's what we're moving towards. Uh, so. That, with that said. All right, great. And Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner, if we could just get an email with everybody's updated contact information, job titles, and responsibilities, since we've got Mr. Laird here now, we can bother him not so much as you, and you can <laughs> kick, it down the, kick it down the can. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Councilman Casey. 
Uh, okay, Director, we're going to move on with our presentation. All right. And I hope that Tamisha gets a nice long vacation after the season is done. She feels a lot of emails from me. Director, um, Director, before we before we go on, um, Councilman Jones have some co um, cost questions about the cost of the vacant properties and vacant lots. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to the director or the commissioner, um, how much does this program cost us? to cut vacant lots and vacant structures? I can, I can, tackle, I can tackle that. Um, budgetarily, with combining these, the uh, general fund dollars as well as CDBG funding, uh, about three to four million dollars. And that's not including equipment. That's just labor. So again, the, the equipment piece has a whole different cost, the capital piece to it. Um, so depending, we, um, we don't, we borrow trucks. Um, we don't have enough tractors because of supply chain issues. So right now, the number I threw at you is just labor. So anywhere between three to three and a half to four million dollars for labor. And, and Mr. Chairman, to um, the director, can we get a, a, a budgetary breakdown on what that means? You know, and then if that's possible to know exactly what, how much equipment is, you know, what that's, what's that budgeted for? Uh, and then as well as I know that we have staff that that's in-house that does the work. Mm -hmm. So having a breakdown of what that looks like. And then you also have seasonal, correct? Mm -hmm. And then what, what does that look like? Uh, and then that, and if we could have that, you know, and then maybe, you know, sit down and take a, even a further look. Because, Mr. Chairman, um, to the director and to the assistant director and the commissioner, we have to do better. So I know that you guys are working on... Um, the, which I, Mr. Chairman, I applaud the administration on uh, looking at a hybrid type program to go and deal with actual structures. So hopefully, Mr. Chairman, to the director and, and the commissioner and as, an assistant director, that um, this may give you some relief where your existing staff then can focus all on those vacant lot structures and uh, hopefully have a better turnaround on that, um, that proposition. And then, Mr. Chairman, um, how much would be the breakdown, how much is it actually costing us to cut a vacant lot? What is that actual cost factor? And then what is the actual cost factor for us, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the director to um, cut structures? So structures and vacant lots. So how much is it actually physically, fundamentally costing us each time we put a person on those lots and cut them? Unless we know that already, Mr. Chairman. Through the chair so, to the councilman, right. we, will be, we'll, we will prepare that information and send it over. Right. And then, Mr. Chairman, that helps us to understand how, as we move down this process, what that looks like. Because if, if, if it's God's will and we're successful with um, uh, putting this out on, 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 you know, uh, on the market space, um, it would give us a better idea if we're even making any savings on this. And then also, Mr. Chairman, it would give us a, a better look um, at if we need to put more money into the actual program so that we can increase this uh, to at least eight cuts, um, one cut at least uh, a month on these structures and these vacant lots. I think that's the least we should be able to do here. All right, thank you, Councilman Jones. Okay, uh, Director, we want to move on with the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Council. We're here to talk about our readiness for snow and ice control for the upcoming season. Uh, we have, uh, since Director Williams has been on board back in June, early this is June, we started a process of, of improvements that we're going to uh, highlight today. Um, one of the things we started already doing is having biweekly meetings with our supervisors and our drivers to talk about some strategic plans in terms of moving forward and getting ready for this year's snow, uh, snow and ice control. Um, when you talk about equipment, we've been already started back in June getting equipment ready, doing the necessary body bolt checks and the preventive maintenance stuff through our MVM division that we need to do. Uh, pretty soon, as of actually as of uh, Friday, we started putting the plows on the trucks and testing them to make sure that they're working properly and the inserts are working properly. So you're going to start to see training as well, uh, drivers going up and down the street with snow plows on them 
while the sun is still shining on both sides of the street. So you'll see that pretty within the next few weeks. Um, as far as equipment is concerned, our frontline equipment, we have 60 tandem and single axle trucks with salt spreaders. In addition, we have 11 road graders, 13 pickup trucks with plows and salt spreaders. We have uh, four front end loaders that are plow, have plow equipped on the front. And then we have some medium-sized utility vehicles for specialized plowing, such as narrow streets, alleyways, and, and uh, really tight subdivisions like Mill Creek, for example. In a very heavy snow event, we will add additional resources from Cleveland Water. They have a, they, right now they have five plow units currently, that they, tandem plow units that they give us. Uh, the, another five are being uh, equipped with plows as we speak. Uh, water pollution control will give us four units with plows. Traffic engineering has four units to have salt and plow capability. And these are smaller pickup trucks, but they're heavy duty pickup trucks that can get through heavy snow. And then we're also in the process at one of the council concerns is why, why are we using waste collection vehicles? So we're piloting in a program with a couple of waste collection vehicles to see how that works out. So all together in a heavy snow, we plan to be able to put out about 112 units if need be around the clock, 24 hours a, on, on uh, 24 hour shifts. Uh, driver training, as I mentioned, starts October 31st, and that'll be the focus will be the first and second year drivers. So you'll see if you go by Muni a lot after October 1st, you'll see some uh, trucks down there training like you do. You see police cars down there training for when they when they're going through their process. We've already received our salt deliveries. We're at total full capacity with 23,000 tons. The salt is stored in seven different locations throughout, strategically throughout the city. Um, and any of our stations can go to any of the six stations and get, or seven locations to get salt uh, on a round the clock basis during the snow event. So we have plenty of salt on hand and de -icer. As far as drivers and staffing, I appreciate this administration allowing us to increase staffing. That's going to really help. Uh, we're going to go from a regular 94 uh, seasonal drivers on top of the 33 full time we have. We're going to bump that number up by 26. So we're going to put on an additional 26 drivers for our second shift, which will now we'll have three full shifts uh, on all three shifts. So instead of having a half a crew on second and using overtime, we're going to reduce overtime. We're going to reduce employee fatigue by adding another 26 drivers. We we're about seven drivers away from that goal. We started back in June recruiting. I personally thought it would be tough to meet that goal, but I'm pleased to say we're, we're only seven away. So I plan to have those guys on, or ladies, or guys or ladies on by November 1st. And Commissioner, these, is all, these all are full-time drivers or it's a mixture? These will be full-time seasonals. They'll work okay. a 40 hour a week, okay. but they'll be in the seasonal category. Okay. Uh, they'll, they'll probably be discontinued sometime in, in April, uh, a good amount of them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did some, we learned some lessons from our last major snow events about narrow streets, alleyways, and residential subdivisions. So we've implemented a specialized crew with specialized right-sized equipment they will go be able to go into those mill creeks, into those beacon places, into those little areas like that, the little place you got over there off of, uh, I think that's a, that little apartment building over there. So Thank you. We, we're, we're very conscious yeah. of the service needs and the size of our equipment and being able to get proper service to those areas. So we've implemented that as well. Uh, there has been an increase in the vehicles. We went from 58 frontline vehicles to 60. We added one new single axle truck and one new tandem axle truck to our fleet, and we'll be making sure that everything is organized properly. Uh, one major issue, major initiative, I should say, is the snow route optimization, and I'll let Director uh, Williams, if he will, speak to that. Through the chair to the council, uh, one of the things that we are looking at is being more efficient, being more efficient in our service delivery. And we had been using routes that were uh, upwards 20 years old at least. And so the, the city has changed. The city's uh, the 
geography has changed, but also the typography or the type of streets that we have has changed. So we want to adapt to that and, and get better at that. So what we've looked at is uh, route optimization. And what it, what it entails to do is balance the routes amongst the city, but also give the turn by turn uh, navigation to the drivers. Now, our goal is not to take the expertise away from the drivers, but addition to give them additional help and also give the newer drivers some help getting through the city in a more efficient manner. So route optimization doesn't fix everything, but it does give a, another tool in our arsenal to be able to provide more efficient service delivery. And where we should see that really help us is when we transition from the main streets into the residential streets and give that service delivery a little better than we had before. This will be a initiative that will take throughout the winter to master as we, as the uh, uh, company does balance our routes. We try them, test them, get the feedback from the drivers, seeing what's working, what's not working, uh, and then we keep um, optimizing throughout the season to get better. Uh, so it will be a, a work in progress, but one that I think is going to be very beneficial to the city long term. Okay, um, Director, I got a question. Now, when you mentioned the, optimis the route op optimization, um, when you switch shifts, so when you go from first shift to second shift, we in a heavy snow. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way where the second shift route driver will know exactly what's not covered versus, you know, I'm just trying to guess what's, what's going on? That's correct. Uh to the chair. So in, inside, the in, inside of the trucks will be in-cab devices that will tell the drivers what they've serviced. And when, you, when we do switch uh, shifts, the new driver will be able to get turn-by-turn uh, -turn instructions to exactly where that last driver left off in that route. Okay. Uh, one of the big things about that, to your very point, is when we do have, for example, where we have the higher, heavier snows on the southeast side, if we move drivers from another yard, they won't have to stop and get maps. They will be able to just punch in those routes that we've sent them to, and they can leave from that area and move over so we uh, reduce dead time. And that's one of the big things that we want to make sure to do is have clean shift changes, but also be able to walk and chew gum at the same time as far as getting uh, crews, you know, to where they need to be in a most efficient manner. On that point. Okay. Um, all right, Councilman Jones. Is, that is, that's, that's beautiful, the way you're, you're talking about this. Is it automated? Yes. Okay. Yes, it utilizes uh, automatic vehicle locators uh, that we have being installed right now, and also uh, in-cab navigation, uh, and we will have that on all of the fleet that is part of Snow and Ice Control. I see. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Councilman Jones. Okay. Uh, also, in a heavy snow, uh, how do we determine, uh, like, say, for instance, we are plowing um, uh, Fleet Avenue and we get some of our main streets done and it, it snow continues to fall three or four hours later, how do we know to sub circle back onto those main streets? What's the, what's the process that we use to say when a driver hits a main street, mm -hmm. how do he knows, how do, we, how do she knows to double back on that street because it needs to be replowed? How do you, how do, how do you assess that? We, we have an internal policy that we try to leave all main streets in fairly good condition before we transition back into the residentials, before we go into the residentials. And if while we're in the residentials or we get some more snow and the main start to cover up, we'll, we'll immediately divert back to the main streets. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, just a point of clarification, we do utilize supervisors and uh, investigators during the, the season to uh, let us know as the streets do cover back over. And so we use that and also roadway temperatures to help us to determine when to go back into the main streets. Okay. All right. So in addition to route optimization, we're also looking at some different treatments uh, or pre-treatments, if you will, uh, that would help us allow us to do a pre-treatment of bridges, hills, and uh, things like the Opportunity Corridor and the West Shoreway. These, right now we have the one unit. We plan to enhance that over the next few years, but right now we're gonna look at focusing on the dangerous hills and bridges and things like that with pre-treatment. Moving forward, we're looking at a different type of snowplow blade that's illustrated right up there. This is a carbon fiber snowplow blade as opposed to the rigid metal ones we have. Uh, we're looking to test those on a number of our units this year to see if they are more efficient, if they last longer, require less blade changes, and do less damage to the roadway. So we're looking at that. 
uh, Director Williams was, uh, presented that idea to us as soon as he got here. We, we jumped right on it. We thought it was a great idea. Finally, uh, to add a little fun to this process, we're going to involve the kids in our recreation facilities in terms of a new thing. Well, it's not new. It was, I think it was done in Columbus. It's called Paint the Plow. So we've got six plows designated. I plan to put one at every station just so the kids can be involved and get a, and get a touch and feel and get an idea what it's like to be a public servant and to be uh, a part of the snow removal process. So we're going to have a few plows paid up. So don't be surprised when you see one or two going through your neighborhoods. Okay. And that should be happening in the next week or two. Okay. Commissioner on the, these new blades, um, are these new blades uh, a lot lighter than, than the traditional heavy metal blades? I believe so. Yes, they are. Okay. So what, what, what are the benefits of these new blades? Or do you have that? And what are the, the benefits that we anticipate with these new blades? Through the chair. To the chair. Uh, the carbon fiber blades are lighter, but they are meant to last longer. Uh, so the idea is for it to reduce blade changes and downtime uh, and also prevent damage so much potholing from plowing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now also the speed tables that we have installed throughout the city. Have we, um, have we started to put the, the training in place for these drivers? How, how are we going to handle those, to those chair, situations? That's part of the October 31st training that you'll be seeing at the Muni lot. We'll be testing those out and testing also blade height yes. uh, and, and how we uh, adjust our blades for uh, plowing for the speed tables. Okay. All right. Any, any questions from my colleagues? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, let's go down. Let's start with Richard Starr, and then we'll come back to uh, Casey, and then go to Rebecca Martin. Mr. Chairman, before we get started, I just want to be down. Kind of merit. She's a, she's our person that's a project coordinator for route optimization. She got to raise your hand. All right. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. All right, Councilman Starr. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just have a few questions that I just want to um, just get clarification on the new process. First, I would like to say thank you. Um, obviously, to our new director, yes, um, we've been here since June and, and been talking um, on different occasions about some of the things that they're trying to implement as far as the technology's component to grass cutting. So I do have a few questions that I wanted to ask. Reg I mean, regarding snow snow removal, my fault. Um, so what I would like to understand is, do uh, Public Works work? in hand-to-hand -hand conjunction with Department of Aging on any initiative with snow removal? Through the chair to the councilman, yes, we do. Most of it is through communications uh, as far as uh, when we have snow events, communicating uh, good neighbor policies and things of that sort. But we also uh, communicate with uh, aging as it relates to uh, weather predictions and forecasts. So we try to make sure that all the departments know what we're doing and also what to expect in a snow and ice control event. Okay, I asked that question because one, I would like to bring to the attention to my colleagues, some of them already probably know this, but um, one of the things that I have an issue with this past snow um, season was um, department agent were helping assist our seniors with snow removal, and I believe it was more so um, the driveway or the walkway, or not the driveway or the walkway, it was one or the other, and I'm like, if you're gonna snow plow or drive, the driveway of a senior, they definitely need a walkway included in, in that process. And I was just wondering, is that something that you work together on, or is that just something we need to talk to <coughs> department agent about improving to make sure our seniors have access to get in and from their um, homes? Through the chair to the councilman. Uh, our work is primarily done in the right-of-way, so the work outside of the right-of-way would be part of uh, Department of Aging. Okay, so that, um, Chair. We got to make, make sure we, we get that to them as well. Um, one question I would ask is, um, I got a chance last year to do a ride along mm -hmm. to get an experience of what it takes to, to um, snow plow. And, and something that was interesting for me to see the amount of work that one individual has to do um, while we're operating the snow truck and making sure that seasonal staff have enough time to train. So my question to the chair would be, I mean to the director, um, through the chair would be, if we have full capacity of staff, how many seasonal staff employees <laughs> slash full-time employees do we need to manage 
um, a snowstorm or, or to operate during this um, snow season? I'll defer to uh, Commissioner Scott for the numbers, but I would mention that uh, from, the, from the director's desk, I look at things more from a place of the people, not so much the equipment. Uh, I don't talk so much about how many pieces of equipment out there because there's a lot of staff that, whether it be radio operators, supervisors, uh, other staff, changing plow blades and all those uh, folk that are part of a snow and ice control event. So to your point, it's very important to us to start training early mm -hmm. like we're doing this year, but also uh, make sure to bring attention to the fact that these are mothers, fathers, uh, brothers that are out here uh, doing this work for many hours at a time. So we're, we've introduced some things uh, sort of uh, referring to uh, fatigue checks and things of that sort to make sure that we're keeping our folks safe so that we can provide the service. Uh, Commissioner Scott can speak to the numbers. And in terms of numbers, we have 33 full-time drivers that will be part of this process, and we're adding an additional 120 seasonals this year, which that number is up by 26 from last year. So, and that's just at the driver, and then we were just some uh, 11 the MCEOs, I believe, that will be brought on to actually load the salt and operate the graders. We're going to bring on another uh, two or three radio operators that will work in Snowbird around the clock, 24-hour shifts, or well, eight, eight, three eight-hour shifts with 24 hours a day, including Saturdays and Sundays. So Snowbird will be open um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. But that is not a call center. Calls will still go through 311. So any calls should go, any calls for uh, snow removal service should go through 311 and they'll be routed to our division appropriately. Okay, and then um, thank you, Commissioner, for that breakdown of, his, of employees. So if we're trying to have a total of almost 140, close to that type amount of um, yes. employees, when are we actually starting to hire them? I know we got training to start on the 31st, um, when is the process of hiring starts? Or before we get into the process of start hiring, what is the process to get hired? Okay. Well, we started back in June. Okay. Because we, we felt it was going to be difficult to get drivers. Uh, everybody's having problems getting drivers. But fortunately, the city of Cleveland has been successful. So we, we were already at that uh, 104, top budgeted number. We we're about seven drivers shy. We should have those seven drivers processed by the end of the month. Uh, will be at full capacity, so that I'm pleased to report that. Uh, as far as the process, it's a, it's a you go through NeoGov. You have to go through our HR NeoGov. Uh, there'll be a posting in there, and you you, you sign up. It's a they call it SRVO, Snow Removal Vehicle Operator, SRVO. So you might be looking for truck driver. It doesn't say truck driver. It says SRVO, and that's how you put in the application. You'll be called, uh, chances are you'll get called in for an interview until we reach capacity. And if you've got some experience, we, experience is preferred. We don't like to take people who've never driven big trucks like that and put them in a unit with that capacity and that size. So if you've got over road experience or previous truck, that, that will be preferred. Yes. But if, and then we'll train you up and make sure that the, and the training is starting. Actually, the training is starting technically now, but it will be in earnest by the end of the month when all the CISOs are on board. And then, Chair, to the Commissioner, for, so from the training standpoint component, how long does it take to get someone trained up uh, with doing the work, rather they're a new employee, new to mm -hmm. snow plowing or working on those big trucks, or even if they have experience, what is that timetable for the training? To be honest with you, the, the training is always going to be ongoing. It takes about two or three winners to become really good at being a snowplow driver. But the basic training will begin now, and we'll get them through the basics. Totally right. and, and, and I love to say that my full-timers or the guys that have been coming back to us season year after year, they're, they're pretty good at training the new drivers. So we'll, we'll put them in the truck together at the beginning. We'll show them the ropes. Uh, the foreman will constantly be making suggestions and improvements on how they could do better or what they should do differently. And this, this is going to be an ongoing process. Thank you. And through, Thank you. through the chair to the councilman, uh, keeping in mind that this training for snow and ice control is levels. Uh, one of the things that, you know, operating the equipment is one part, but then learning the city is the other part, yes. uh, depending on where you're stationed. So that's one of the things that route optimization will help uh, with that turn by turn navigation that we will be implementing this season. And then my, my, my last point would be um, 
ensuring that all of all the all the staff have the support, but making sure we have enough staff that are actually working. One thing that I I um I learned from 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 getting out and and working with you all is sometimes we don't have full capacity on certain ships. And you may say we got 10 trucks at a station, but then only two of them went out for the second shift while we're still in the middle of a snowstorm. So I, I am interested in seeing with the technology, are there something we can do similar to how Commissioner um, Anthony Scott does with um, our weekly updates on what area of grass that is being cut, but how can we do an update on a regular um, daily or something that shows us what area has been plowed or, or anything to help us out to understand because one thing our residents do, and, and I can tell you from, from experience that I've learned, and one of the things that I talked to you, Director Williams, through the chair, was about the fact that if we don't get services taken care of, our residents don't elect us. Bottom line, if, if, if we have to call and get things done and keep asking about it, our residents are going to remember that when it's time to vote for us. So one of the things that I try to do is learn through you what's the best way to get your information, mm -hmm. how to track it to you. I know we work 311. Sometimes we say, hey, get a picture, send it out, those type of things. I'm just interested to see how this technology is going to move us into the right modern day of snow removal, but also making sure we understand that if, the, if it's snowing and we don't get these roads and people are stuck in their house, only person they're going to call is their council person. They're not going to say nothing to the mayor who, who's actually responsible for this, not council, if you, if you look by uh, responsibilities and job duties. But as elected officials, we are the first line of any defense or issues problems that our residents may have. And it's our duty to make sure they have the services. So I will also ask, um, we do, council, we do not allocate funds for a snowplow crew, do we? No, no, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I'm about to say things have changed, I bet. Uh, <laughs> uh, so some of the things I would just like to say is um, working with um, Positive My CDC to figure out how we can help some of our residents um, with snow removal because we do have seniors that still live in their home, um, and they're sometimes by themselves, and they're not able to get out when we get those major um, snow blizzards like we did earlier this year. But that's all I have for the rest today. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the table for um, coming to talk talk about some of the updates that we're going to see this year in snow. And I will be watching, I will be out, and I will be able to support you as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through okay. the chair, to the, to the councilman, uh, one of the things that you will also see on the, uh, part of the route optimization piece is a revamp of the public facing uh, snow plow tracker that you'll be able to see uh, in, in almost real time what has been serviced throughout the area, but I do understand your comments and we do operate from a place of transparency and operation, so uh, I'll see you out there and we'll be out there together at some point, I'm sure. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. All right, Councilwoman Rebecca Mark. Thank you, and thank you, Director. I will also take you up on the offer to do a ride along uh, whenever we have our, our first snow. I, um, I found that going to the garages, uh, I have both the Ridge Road Transfer Station and the East 65th garage um, that service my ward, and going to those early on in January was uh, some, of the, some of the best hours I've spent in local government. You have some great guys over there, and um, uh, just people who are, uh, it helped me understand a lot about what's going on. Um, and, and leads me to some of my questions today. So with the route optimization, is that essentially a GPS system um, that will have both a public facing aspect and an in-cab um, platform for the drivers through the chair to the director? Through the chair to the, to the councilwoman. <laughs> uh, yes, that, that's, that's the case, but also part of route optimization is the balancing of our fleet across the city uh, is, is also a part of that route optimization process. Got it. And, you know, one thing that I learned um, from my first snowstorms, and you guys have been through many more than I have, um, is that everybody thinks that everybody else is getting better service. They, they think, oh, on, on the east side's getting better, the west side's getting better, uh, how come these streets got done and not mine, or my street always gets done last. Um, is there an element of the route optimization that 
um, essentially rotates which streets go first, or when we implement this, will we have a more consistent pattern that's done every time, where when we get to residentials, it's a particular set of residentials that go first, second, third, fourth, through the, through the chair to the director. Through the chair to the councilwoman. Uh, it, the idea is to be as systematic as possible, but no snow event is the same. So uh, what our goal is, is to actually respond and react to the actual weather that we're getting. In, in many cases, we get heavier snows on certain parts of, of the uh, city, so we, we would uh, react to those areas the best we can. Keep it in mind also, depending on the operation, the actual type of operation, if we are in full plow only mode or if we're salting, sometimes you can see a difference between the distance between uh, a resident st residential street and our location. It may can seem longer, but just because of the travel time. Got it. Okay, that helps. Because I, I think that's something that happens in my ward is that my west side subsections are small and manageable, and then my east side subsections are huge. Even for the for the cutting, you know, I've, I've heard the crew members say, like, we don't like going into Ward 12, subsection 10 or 11, because those are huge, and so they take, like, weeks to they take a week or more to do. And so the plow drivers also, it, it's almost like hard to get into the detail of the tiny streets in those subsections. So would we essentially be abandoning the subsection model when we go to this route optimization? Through the chair to the councilwoman, absolutely yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yes. It, it, it was designed more for uh, the park maintenance operations, not so much for uh, the streets uh, division's operations. So the idea of balancing these routes should eliminate that issue. Okay. They will be more equidistant in mileage. Okay, great. Um, I think that will help too because I had like one subsection where there's a tiny set of sort of cul-de-sacs that are off of a secondary main and so they those cul-de-sacs always got forgotten and so they would take a while to get to them. So I think I, I'm excited to see what this GPS has to offer. W with these changes, um, I'm just looking up the old snow removal policy that we were last time. Um, when unfortunately, your predecessor, I think, got a bit of a grilling from council after the two major snowstorms in January of last year. We got the snow removal policy that, um, you know, for six inches and above, the goal was for residential streets to get a first pass within 72 hours. Is that still the standard that you are going to be looking for, or are you going to be trying to to lower that through the chair to the director. Through the chair to the councilwoman. Uh, right now, it will remain until we get through the balancing of routes and our route optimization process, and then it will be reevaluated. But the goal uh, is to do the, the work as efficiently as, po as possible. Uh, those are just more of a guideline, in my opinion. I, I would like to beat those every event. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know when, when we're not getting, uh, you know, catastrophic, uh, it's 18 inches, we, we often do. But I, I even hear um, folks already asking me about the snow plan. So this helps me sort of say that those old, these, these, these numbers, you know, 72 hours for six inches and above, let's see, four to six inches residential streets within 48 hours, one to four inches residential streets in 24 to 36. That, that still sounds reasonable to you? Through the chair to the councilwoman, yes. Okay, great. That's super helpful. Um, the I, I I spent a fair amount of time with you, Commissioner Scott, um, working on bump outs on Fleet Avenue, and it seems like a small issue, but I'll tell you why it is a big issue because that is our business parking for our small businesses along Fleet Avenue. A uh, similar issue along Broadview Road, places like Steve's Restaurant, uh, Saucy Son, our our woman-owned butcher shop. Um, those because of those bump outs not being done. Um, it took, I believe, like a week and a half to two weeks um, to get those finally done because it required a, um, those smaller trucks. They couldn't have the business parking that they needed. Um, and I know that there are other areas of the city that have bump outs and newer designed streets. Um, is there any additional planning for those roads with um, business parking as bump outs? Through the chair to the director. Mr. Mr. Chairman to the council lady, we went through that experience on Fleet Avenue uh, as the streets are designed, they're designed and with different amenities. We have to adjust to those amenities. We're used to doing straight plowing and not in and out of those bump outs. But realizing what we went through last year, we, we're right-sizing the fleet to try to deal with issues like that. And we're also adding attachments to our some of our inloaders that will allow us to get into those. And we would need your assistance in terms of having a business not parked there doing snow events. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could talk about some signage too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would certainly um, be happy to talk about Fleet in particular, because I think that's really the one where 
if you're not realizing where the bump outs are, then when you're plowing, you're moving the snow into the bump outs, and then it took even longer yes. to get them handled. Um, so um, I would welcome a chance to talk about that. And then, um, it, you know, I have a few areas. Um, <laughs> South Hills and Broaddale come to mind where the road is wider than normal because it curves. And, um, you know, we had some concerns as the first pass had happened, one lane was opened, um, but then there was never a second pass to open up two-way two -way traffic because I think the drivers didn't know the area and didn't really know where the curbs are. If you have a wide area like that, is it useful for residents to put up those, um, like, little uh, stick, the, you know, sort of red-marked sticks to show where the... Um, uh, the stakes to show where the curb is. Is that a useful thing for residents to do? Yes, very helpful. Okay, great. Um, that sounds like something I can, that sounds like an action item I can give to my residents. Um, so it sounds like maybe, um, Commissioner, you and I can work together on the bump outs. I will tell my residents about putting those stakes <coughs> to better show if, they're, if the street is at a, is in an odd area. Um, the polycarbon blades, um, one question I have is that one thing I learned when I went to the East 65th Street Garage is that, you know, of course, we have a long history of, of really excellent welders and that, you know, we are really exceptional in terms of the maintenance of these blade, of, of the blades that we previously used and um, other cities come to us for our expertise in this area. Does changing over to these polycarbon blades um, sort of make any part of that weld shop um, uh, less useful to us, or does that change how those welders are utilized within the city through the chair? No, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the council lady, the blades are the final attachment at the bottom. That has nothing to do with the actual structure of the plow itself. Got it. So our welders actually deal with the structures. We we built, we design and build, redesign and build our own plows. We did about ten this year for this upcoming season. The blade is the final attachment. The welders will still be responsible for replacing those. Got it. Okay, great. Because um, you've got a lot of talent. You've got a lot of talent at that shop. I don't want it to, to go to waste. Um, uh, last question. We did have, I'm um, kind of following up on Councilman Starr. Um, you know, one thing I learned last January was that we, you know, certainly had some um, either high medical needs or um, uh, sort of critical access issues for for certain streets that we would have, you know, okay, this person is a, a veteran who needs to get to the VA for, you know, a certain number of appointments each week. And if he's stuck in the house for three, four days, I'm going to get a call from his caretaker and it's going to be detrimental to his health. Is there any um, sort of preparation or identification of, you know, real emergent medical um, it, it, streets that have somebody with a high medical need and that those can be prioritized or anything like that through the chair to the director? Through the chair to the councilwoman. We don't have specialized service for uh, residential streets, but we do communicate with safety as it relates to keeping the hospitals open and their pathways uh, to the hospitals, especially from the expressways to the hospitals, uh, prioritize. And we do, uh, on occasion, do get emergencies where we do have to uh, help a ambulance or a fire truck. And we, we have that communication with, with the uh, public safety department for when those uh, emergencies do occur. Got it. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, obviously everyone's going to think that it's, it's, their, it, it's their family member that's the highest need. So it's tough to open it up to that sort of individualized assessment. But as we get through this season and we reflect on the optimization, I would love to be, for that to be part of the conversation. You know, even sort of senior hot meal delivery. I mean, you know, my, my executive assistant shoveled some walkways last January because we had just some folks who were trapped and couldn't get food. Um, and so that sort of analysis is obviously at a even higher level than where we're at right now. And I think we have a snow season to get through, but um, I really hope that we have the chance to, to move in that direction in the years ahead, because I think that would be really the next level of, of service for the residents. Through the chair to the councilwoman, I agree. One of the, the two of the things I would mention that helps with what what you're talking about is the optimization and getting that time down. Uh, if we can get the goals down uh, to something more reasonable, that would help with that. But also right size into fleet, as Commissioner Scott mentioned, the better, the more nimble our fleet is. It ha also helps with being able to uh, improve that service delivery. Got it. Um, and then one last thing, the optimization system. Do we have a name for that vendor? What is, is it the same one from last year or is it a new one through the chair? 
to up the through the chairs. There's Councilwoman the Rubicon is the vendor that we chose this year. Okay. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what their public facing uh, branding is, but I can get that to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council, Councilwoman Mario. Uh, Councilman Brian Case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner, every year some radio state or some radio or some, some TV news does a story about our fleet, right? That we have 60, and I'm assuming the, the 60 uh, tandem axle trucks are the big ones that we're used mm -hmm. to seeing, correct? Are all those, Mr. Chairman to the commissioner, are all those serviced, ready to go, as soon as we get that first big snowstorm? Are they, they, none of them are sitting over at MV Motor Vehicle, MVM waiting on a part or anything like that, we're all, are we all ready to go with all those 60 trucks? To the chair, to the councilman, no, we're not ready as of yet. Uh, we're about 60% through with uh, our winterization of our fleet, uh, but we, I've talked to uh, MVM and they will have everything ready to go uh, by that uh, October 31st training date. All right, so we're 60% through winterization of the trucks, and we're gonna be 100% within the next 28 days. To the chair, to the councilman, that's correct. Okay, and then after October 31st, those 60 trucks are ready to go. To the chair, to the councilman, yes. Okay, and then in heavy snow events when we have to utilize other divisions for, um, for trucks, Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner, is that an in-kind service or are, we, are they charging back to us, especially the enterprise funds? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, that's being discussed right now. Uh, in past, it uh, was in-kind. But okay. now with recent changes on their end, uh, we're talking about a billing process, a, a, a chargeback process. Ridiculous, but that's okay. Um, and then one last question. How many streets are there in the city of Cleveland? Do you know? Uh, there are 10,060 streets. 10,060 streets. So in, in the course of a heavy snowstorm, right, and sometimes we, we need to put this into perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Within 72 hours, it's your goal to clear 10,060 streets within 72 hours of a snowstorm. And we're talking the end of the snowstorm, right? That 72 hours doesn't start when the snowstorm starts. It starts when the snowstorm stops because there's no sense clearing the street in the middle of a blizzard, correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay. And then... Um, that's good to know, 10,060 streets. That just probably doesn't include alleyways either, does it? That, it includes all dedicated city streets. All, all city streets that, that, you, that you guys clean, mm -hmm. right? Okay, and then one last question I wanna to touch on, or one last thing, Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner. We're using the snow tracker again this year? Through the chair to the council, um, the council person, no. Uh, we are revamping that with our route optimization process, so the public facing uh, snow tracker will be new and improved. Okay, will it be accurate? <laughs> Through the chair to the council, I mean, yes, it will be accurate. I mean, and I only say that because last year, a lot of residents in the city of Cleveland utilized that, and there was misinformation on it, and I think that the public perception, and it almost set in my opinion, from the number of phone calls that everybody on this side of the table received, it almost set the city in a, in a panic mode, right? I mean, it really did, because people were thinking that they were snowed in, and then when the second snowstorm hit, a lot of people went to utilize that just to get the information, and it wasn't spewing out the correct information. So whatever it is this year that you're using, snow tracker, optimization, whatever it is that you're gonna put in front of the public, Please, I deplore you and I beg you to make sure that that information is accurate. Nobody cares what the information is as long as it's accurate information. They may not like the information that they're getting, but it is the information that they're getting. So if we could please make sure that that is the most accurate information that we could possibly give out to our residents, that would be greatly appreciated. And I believe in the occasion of that big snowstorm that we know at some point we're going to get and people start utilizing that tool whatever it is as long as it's accurate it will it'll bring the it'll bring a calm to the storm right, right. um hopefully but it's got to be accurate information 
to the chair, to the councilman, your point is well taken. One thing we know, if man makes it, it will break at some point, and we are making sure to train with that in mind so that when we have to do manual uh, operations to update that tracker, that it is uh, working functionally and also transparently in a way uh, that makes sure that if there are issues that we communicate those to the residents quickly. And, and if it does go down or something happens, just let people know, right? The information may not be updated or it will be updated within X amount of time or, or what have you. But the last thing we need is what happened last year and people thinking that their streets were plowed because they looking at that snow tracker and it wasn't and da 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 da, -da. We, we went from there. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all you guys do for, for the city. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman Casey. Uh, we're gonna go to Councilman Joe Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, let me just say this. Um, I wanna thank um, Commissioner Scott for being involved. Uh, when I give him a call, he picks the phone up. He handles it um, right there with a constituent on, on board in the conversation, and he deals with those issues firsthand. Uh, I really appreciate the work you do. I know that there's been a number of times I've called you as well as text you and given you photos, and you've, you've gotten your crews out there and they've taken care of. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, the director, um, the stuff that we need to get taken care of in the neighborhood. Uh, one of the things that we, we have a deficiency just put in on your radar screen is we need to get someone out there who can empty those garbage containers on our main strips, especially on Lee Road. Um, the consistency is not there and it hasn't been there now for quite some time. Uh, for my entire duration as an elected official, uh, and I would like to see that situation of deficiency improved. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, we, we have a great director in Commissioner Scott, and this city is actually blessed to have him um, because of his time, his depth of knowledge, uh, and his ability and capacity to get things done. So this council person is really appreciative of the work that you do um, for the citizens in our neighborhood, and I wanted to take that opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to, to just say thank you for the work that you do. You're Mr. Chairman, welcome. looking here at the presentation for um, the snow and ice control readiness for this season, um, one of my concerns is, is that, you know, I, I hear this table, we've been in a frenzy uh, on how we spend ARPA funds. And there has been, you know, and we have not had a session of council where we could get in a little room and really put buckets together and really fundamentally talk about how we reinforce our infrastructure to provide services to our citizens. And Mr. Chairman, there would be no other department that I think is significant and important like this department in terms of our vacant lots, our grass cuts, our snow plows, and being able to use ARPA funds to, to buy the type of equipment that we need to, to have in order to provide those services. Um, these are the very bread and potato, meat and potato rather, of services that are needed for our neighborhoods. And we need to make sure that just as, as much as we um, have issue with making sure we have EMS trucks and making sure that we have fire trucks and make sure that we have police vehicles, we need to also be talking about how this department, unfortunately, uh, needs the same kinds of supplies and materials to do the work that they do. So with that being said, Mr. Chairman, to uh, the director, are we looking at, and I know that you have increased um, uh, the trucks here and you're moving from other departments. I mean, what is um, our fleet analysis? Do we have a report on what our fleet analyses are? Through the chair to the councilman. Uh, that, that is something that is ongoing. Uh, our as asset management uh, areas, that's one of the areas that Mr. Laird is going to be overseeing. Uh, but one of the things that I would mention is, we, uh, Commissioner Scott mentioned right-sizing the fleet. Uh, that's one of the biggest things that I'll be working on over the next couple of seasons, especially at the adoption of the complete streets and uh, doing more bike lanes and more protected bike lanes and things like that. We're gonna need to start pur purchasing equipment, uh, smaller equipment to be able to be nimble and service those areas. We don't want to be uh, the department that stands uh, in front of uh, modernization of our city because we don't have the right equipment to service it. So that won't be an excuse that the department will have. We will continue. Uh, we're, this year we are working through a lot of supply chain issues to uh, get our fleet, but uh, whether it be uh, 
snow plows on tractors, whether it be bobcats with plows, things like that, especially equipment that can work in different areas, whether it be uh, during the summer in a vacant lot, but also during snow and ice control uh, on the street. So to your point, yes. And, and Mr. Chairman, and you know, and this is something that, you know, for readiness, not only for the, the snow division piece, but also for um, um, our, our vacant lots in terms of the, the, the equipment that we need to have there as well. I mean, we've, we've had these vacant lot programs for quite some time. We should have, all, I mean, I would presume that we would have an idea of what, we, what our actual needs are. And so while we have these funds, Mr. Chairman, to the director, the commissioners, um, you know, certainly I would think would have an idea of, of what we need to have in order to get, for an example, um, our cuts up and get our snow plow equipment in, in place and the kind of equipment, and I, and I know that Mr. Casey talked about it in his process, that we're, it seems like we're borrowing from other areas and locations just to get this number up to 112. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman to the Director? That is correct. And so, Mr. Chairman to the Director, we should, we should have all the equipment. Um, and we should, we should go out and ask to utilize ARPA funds to do that. Um, those funds were put into play um, from President Biden for the purpose of, of, of fundamentally uh, making our city strong and whole. And part of that is making sure that we have the right people and the equipment in place to be able to provide the services our citizens need. And I know that right now everybody is coming to uh, the fountain to drink uh, with all sorts of things. But I think before we even look at all these other sorts of things, we need to make sure that our city is whole. Uh, I fundamentally believe that if we do that, then we prepare and equip our city to be able to provide the kind of services that our citizens deserve to have. So, Mr. Chairman, I would be, you know, hopeful that that we would be able to do that. Hopefully, sometime soon, because if we wait too long, we won't have any money. And I want to sit here and champion on this side of the table to make sure that we have the uh, the equipment and the capacity so that we can provide those services to this to our citizens, and that's important to me. And so, Mr. Chairman, moving on, 112 units. So I, this is up, Mr. Chairman, 32 units from the 80 that we had before previously. Mr. Chairman, we we have our frontline units. Uh, the, the 80 or so that uh, we normally have, that, that's within the division of streets. When we get into a heavy snow, we will call our colleagues over at utilities and other areas, other divisions in the city and put together a, a supplemental fleet that takes us from that 80 to 112. I see. And so, and so, Mr. Chairman, so we somewhat got an idea of what we're going to have to do. So, but with this improved process here that we got, one of the things that I've experienced, Mr. Chairman, to the director to let you and the commissioner, um, has been um, the side streets. You know, and I've had an opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to go throughout when I've seen these kinds of situations happen. I've called you, I've mm -hmm. called others, I've called Cox mm -hmm. about our side streets being snow plowed, snowed in for more than a day, mm -hmm. more than two days. In some instances, up to four days, uh, those side streets have not. And, and Mr. Chairman, um, to Mr. Williams, that is the first time I've ever experienced, you know, on a consistency, um, the, the failure of the system to be able to get to those streets and plow those streets out, uh, where people have to get to work, and in some cases, they can't get out to the street and they're getting stuck. Uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, what makes it even more egregious is you can't even get an emergency truck down those streets uh, in order to, if a person has an emergency, um, you can't get them down the street. So if someone needs to get out of their driveways, they need to go to the grocery stores, they need to pick up their medications, they're snowed in. And, and two to three to four days, Mr. Chairman, uh, is certainly unacceptable. And we have to do a better job. And, and that's my experience in Ward 1 on the southeast side of the city of Cleveland. And, and Mr. Chairman, I will say this, because this is important to say, Mr. Chairman, uh, coming back in the four years and serving on city council, I have found the public service department, um, if, if I had to grade it, it it's, a, it's, not in a bad, it's not in a good place. Um, in years past, uh, when another mayor ran this city, we never had this kind of nonsense. Not at all. 
Not at all, not one iota. Uh, from our vacant lots issue, in which I know that that has increased, so you know, of course, over space and time, you have to give deference there. But in terms of our snow plowing, War One has never seen uh, the failure of public service at, at this scale. And, and at best, D, I would give you, just because this is the new administration, um, but we have to do better with those citizens. If we lose, Mr. Chairman, the Lee Harbor War One area, we've lost all of the east side of the city of Cleveland. So we have to do everything we can, Mr. Chairman, to the director and to the commissioners who are here and the assistant director to really do whatever we can to keep that part of the city as best we can to offer and provide services because those citizens deserve it, number one. And number two, they've earned it and they're still in their homes. And right now, we have had an exodus. Whether we want to believe that or not, we've had an exodus in our city and we see that in terms of the numbers and the decreasing of numbers. Uh, we won't be able to retain our populations if we can't provide quality services like other cities around us, Garfield, Maple Heights, Warnsville, and Shaker Heights. So when those citizens compare and contrast the services right across their borders with these other cities and they can't get out of their homes and two, three, and four days because the snow has got them in and their, their cars are being stuck on the street, unacceptable. So, but what I am glad to see, Mr. Chairman, with the new director is that we're changing course that we're looking at trying to put together another type of program with a new routing system in addition to adding more equipment. So I really appreciate the fact that with this, we're shaking up both in the vacant lots area in terms of looking at um, putting a hybrid program out and seeing how that works and, and putting that in place to make sure we take the pressure off and to be able to provide more services. So with that, Mr. Chairman, kudos uh, to the administration for looking at doing something different. Uh, I've had this conversation several times at this table, uh, dealing with the former administration and Mr. Chairman. It fell on deaf ears. And you know what I got in response? It is what it is. And it is what it is, Mr. Chairman, is unacceptable. And so I'm appreciative, Mr. Chairman, that we have this administration for the first time in four years that's coming up with something a little bit different than it is what it is. You might as well just accept it and get over it. Our citizens deserve better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Councilman Jones. Uh, I just wanna say that um, all of our citizens are important. Um, uh, no matter what neighborhood you live in, all of our citizens are important, okay? Uh, we gonna open it up to miscellaneous. I'm gonna go to uh, Councilman uh, Harrison. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'll be, uh, I'll be quick. Uh, to the chair, to uh, the director, and I would assume commissioner too. Collinwood Stadium, the blue wall. We've been talking about this blue wall for quite some time. I know I mentioned it to you early on as you came in, but the commissioner is aware of the, uh, of the blue wall at the stadium that is the peel paint that is across that has been like that for quite some time. I've also mentioned it to Director Cox on his way out the door. I've also mentioned it to uh, Chief T. Wan, as she said at the table during the, um, the budget hearing process. But that blue wall, we, we, got, we have to do something about this blue wall. It is, the paint is, it, it looks horrible. So when we bring folks to uh, play games uh, at Collinwood School, <coughs> even the, the Muni Leagues that are there, just the residents who are walking the track, who are, who are actively uh, working out in the neighborhood, it, it looks bad. In fact, I got another email this morning about the blue wall uh, from individuals in the community. Uh, I will say through the chair to the director and the commissioner that the uh, athletic department at the school is willing to pitch in and help any way that they can to ensure that the wall uh, is painted. You know, a great mural will, will look good on that wall. You know, there's some options out there. But uh, to the chair, to the director, and the commissioner, you know, I really want us to, to figure out when we're going to get this done. You know, I, I, I know we all got a lot, a lot of things going on, but, you know, what I, I do not want to go into another year with this wall looking the way it does. So I would just ask that we get together and figure out a, a real plan to address the wall, which I know we will, but I want to make sure that I put it back on your, on your minds. You know, again, I'm looking at your presentation. You got a lot going on. You're trying to 
you know, in one season, get prepared. And the wall may not be high up on that list, but I want to make sure that we uh, uh, keep that on your minds, in the front of your minds, because that is a, a high priority for the community uh, in that neighborhood. All right. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, and lastly, Mr. Chair, to uh, the commissioner and director, the parking lot that's uh, going south on 152nd Street. The commissioner team has, you know, really done what they can on the exterior, but I'm not sure whose responsibility that is to maintain that parking lot as you go south on 152nd Street that is used for the Collins Stadium, because they, the city, when they redid the parking lot, when they installed the parking lot, beautiful landscaping, bushes, plants, everything, and now it's just, a, it's, a, it's just, it's not maintained at the level that it, it should be maintained. So I don't know if that comes out of the, the school district assist with that or that is that is that's the parks area that handles that I'm not sure it handles that but they have done uh, what I believe that they have are able to do but I'm really asking if, if we can really do a more detailed uh, um, process on that lot when we go out you know to try to um, bring it back to life you know a little bit better mr. chair to the chair to the councilman <clears throat> excuse me uh, honestly, I am not aware if it's my parks team or CMSD, so I'll oh, look yeah. into it and follow up with you. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to put those two. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman Harrison. Uh, count, we're going to go right back to Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Quickly. Chairman. To the director, Seville Avenue, we have a salt mine there. Um, I was um, in office when we approved it, when Mike White was the mayor of the city of Cleveland. Um, it is falling apart. It, it, the fundamental thing that it should have had in terms of maintenance is, sh is shingles. So when the shingles went missing, the water hit it, and now you can see the wood rottening the whole nine yards. Um, hopefully we can get that fixed up, as well as the maintenance of that area. It doesn't look well. So we've had residents on Seville Avenue talking about that. And then also on Johnson Parkway, again, another facility that was established 20-some years ago. Um, it looks really bad. The maintenance and upkeep of the building, I mean, if we're the service center, we should look like we're the service center, <laughs> not an issue, um, um, uh, uh, you know, as it looks right now. So if, if we could, you know, maintain the exterior of that building, keep the grass cut, keep it clean, fix it up, uh, that, Mr. Chairman, um, that would be appreciative. And it, it represents what we do already or what we should be doing. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Okay, Director, we really appreciate your, uh, yes. uh, your time and your effort, and uh, we, it was very informative. Uh, we are looking um, for, for just improvements in, in all of our departments, not just one department. But we uh, just like I want to echo what Councilman Jones has said about the grass cutting. It is very, very important that we provide our residents with uh, proper service. Okay, Director? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You, Mr. Thank Chair. you, Council. Just a minute. No, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hold on. Uh, before we before we adjourn this committee, uh, I do want to I do want to reiterate that it's important that we all um, get here on time. Um, we had to start the meeting with half of our committee that was that was absent. So if if in the future, if please uh, get here on time. I know we didn't have any legislation today, but it's important that we all arrive on time. All right, the MSP uh, committee is adjourned.